Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this session on citizen science. Thanks for being here uh, today. My name is Melissa Graham. I work for Rubin Observatory at the University of Washington. And today um, we're going to start with like a little very brief introduction about um, sort of how citizen science will be done with Rubin Observatory in operations. Um, just a couple of slides overviewing that and then we're going to turn it over and hear from Chris Lintot all about uh, citizen science. So when I get going with our intro slides. Now, that was not what I wanted to do. <laughs> what has happened? Fascinating. Let's try this. Okay. Somehow clicking on the slide, it was like there's a link. Right. Right, our friendly reminders. We have a code of conduct for the meeting. You can find it in the Project and Community website. If you experience or witness anything um, that seems like a violation of the code of conduct, please go to the code of, code of conduct in the website and you will find their workplace culture advocates and contact information for them. And those are the people that you contact and they will um, help you deal with the situation that you experience and, and advise you on what to do next. Other reminders are that all talks of this workshop are recorded. This one is being recorded right now. You just keep your video off then uh, you won't be recorded. We're working to post the recordings the next day. As questions come in in the Slack, we really like it if you um, give it some kind of emoji, like a thumbs up uh, to prioritize questions in the Slack. And of course, when speakers are done speaking, you can show your appreciation using the reactions in Zoom as well. Right, so I already kind of told you what we wanted to do today in this session on citizen science. So I think we'll just jump right in. And the first slide, it's going to be Amanda or Lauren speaking to this one, right? Yeah, hi, Melissa. Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm here to talk about um, what EPO is doing for citizen science currently in construction and how that will help people do citizen science and operations. Um, so as EPO, we made the decision that we weren't necessarily going to do our own citizen science projects. And instead we wanted to focus our effort on supporting the scientific community and creating their own projects themselves. Um, and so what that means is that in construction, we're leading the creation of a pipeline to enable a Rubin scientist to use the Rubin science platform to send their data directly to the Zooniverse for use in their project builder tool there. And so we're eliminating this step of, in, the, in the realm of Rubin of downloading and re-uploading data and really trying to make it as seamless as possible for a person to use the tools they're already using for their science and the science platform to go ahead and create a citizen science project. And so what we're actually constructing then um, is a Python package in the Rubin science platform um, so that scientists can easily use this Python. The goal here is to make it, you know, something that's already in a format that we're all used to using as scientists and not extra code that you need to learn. Um, and to also provide documentation of how to use that code and the pipeline, um, procedures for using it, and best practices. So really trying to create the tools that will set people up to make successful projects. Um, and then in operations, EPO is going to work with the scientists to help craft a project. If you have questions about, you know, how could it be more engaging with the public, That's something that we could provide expertise on. Um, and also in helping people, scientists promote their projects through our communications channels. So we're going to be having our website and social media and all of that stuff that we can do to help get people engaged with the projects that you'll be creating. Awesome, thank you, Lauren. Um, another aspect of citizen science during Rubin operations comes from or will come from the community engagement team or the CET for short. Um, and so, the community engagement team, our aim is to maximize scientific results from Rubin by engaging the community and supporting scientists in their LSST related research, all of their uh, research um, pretty much, but given the unique size and complexity of the LSST data set, um, we anticipate that there will be certain scientific results that are only obtainable via citizen science methodologies. So that's why the community engagement team um, will also be participating in helping LSST scientists to do citizen science as part of their research. 
So we plan to support scientists in designing your citizen science programs for your research. Uh, like for example, making sure that the, the data products that you're using from LSST are best suited for your research goals for your citizen science project and things like that. We'll be helping to prepare um, the relevant LSST data and documentation for citizen science programs. And then of course, we'll be coordinating heavily with EPO and Zooniverse to install LSST data and, you, and then also to help the scientists use the outputs of their, of like the data created by their citizen science program to use those outputs for their science as well. Um, so in the future, the CET will have two staff positions um, focused on support for citizen science programs and operations. And they start, I forget exactly when they're stated to start, but it's before operations. So in the next year or two, we'll see those people um, coming online and joining the team and starting to get ready for citizen science and operations. So at this point, before we uh, go on to Chris Lintot's talk about citizen science, we just sort of wanted to pause and see if there are any questions about, like in general, about citizen science with Rubin Observatory uh, in operations. Oh, it looks like Meg has one um, in the Slack, which I think is probably for Lauren. Um, Lauren, can you see the Slack? Yeah, I can, I have it up. Okay, um, would you like to take this one? Yeah, so um, for people who can't see the Slack, uh, Meg's question is about the EPO Python package that I mentioned and its ability to upla upload data only from the Rubin Science platform or not. Um, yeah, I think that the goal is that anyone who has the data rights access to the data, the LSST data, should be able to use this tool to create a citizen science Python package. Um, and we are focusing on developing it through the Rubin Science platform as the place where you're already interacting with the data. Um, and so that's our initial goal for this construction period. Um, in the future, how far we can abstract that outside of the Rubin Science platform, I don't think we've really decided yet. Hopefully that answers your question. If not, I can definitely follow up in the Slack too. I, I apologize. I'm raising my hand manually because I can't find the raise hand button. <laughs> and I can't see. Oh, hey, Charles. Hi. It's nice Charles Liu. Hi. Hello. Um, I don't want to take any time on uh, Chris's talk, so I, we can ask this later if this is too complicated an answer. But um, yesterday, I think um, Amanda spoke about the EPO taking over the main portal uh, on the web for uh, Vera Rubin and LSST operations, and there would be a tab on top that says for scientists and another for educators or something like that, right? Uh, I think I understood it that way. Does that mean that it will be a separate tab at the top for citizen science in particular, or is at the moment that's still fluid and not, not quite certain? Because this seems like a very, very significant uh, part of what the forward-facing or the outward-facing uh, science for Rubin will be LSST in general. Um, do you want to answer, Melissa, or I can, I can yeah, go first? Yeah, I'm thinking about the question. I mean, sort of when we talk about citizen science, right, there's helping the scientists to do citizen science. So we would have information for scientists who, like, want to design their citizen science programs, and that would fall under for science uh, because it's for the scientists. And then you would see, like, the front end of those citizen science programs that are, like, directed to the people who are the public who would be doing that citizen science, the citizens, basically, um, that would be on the, the EPO site would be directed towards the citizens. Um, I think, does that kind of answer your question? It exactly answers my question. Thank you. No, it, it's very, it, it's very exciting to me that I think that this is being integrated both from the scientist side and from the front facing side. So this is what that was exactly what I was asking. Thank you. These are all good questions. Nothing else in the chat, nothing else in the Slack. No other hands are raised, I think, right now. So I'm going to stop my screen share and I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Thank you very much. Let me see if I can steal the screen sharing, which will be good. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, it's exciting to be here, partly because I feel like I've been talking um, to various crowds about 
um, citizen science and Vera Rubin at the PCW for, for many years. And I, I feel we're now getting to the point where we have a concrete understanding of what we can do and excitement from people like you, I hope, uh, who have projects that they might want to do. Um, I think something Charles just raised there is really important because these projects, though we refer to them as citizen science internally, that's sort of the term of art for uh, this sort of thing uh, where the public in its broadest sense or several publics engage with data with the purpose of producing authentic or contributing to authentic science results. We call that citizen science, but that's not a very good forward facing term. No one, uh, well, very few people sit down at the start of an evening and think, oh, okay, I'm bored now. I finished my work for the day. Let's be a citizen scientist. That's for many people, unfortunately, an aspirational term. And so what we want is a way for people to stumble into science. And the title of this session was Citizen Science for Science and Engagement. And I think um, as we think about what projects we might build, it's really important to bear both halves of that in mind. So um, obviously science is best represented by a graph. So this happens to be uh, from Galaxy Zoom, my home project, Brooke Simmons' work on the bar fraction as a function of of cosmological time uh, based on the careful classifications of maybe a million galaxy, nearly a million galaxies from Sloan, um, which were contributed by hundreds of thousands of volunteers and carefully analyzed by the science team to produce scientific results in the form of papers uh, that happily slip into the literature. And you could read without ever really being aware that there were volunteers involved. Um, there are, of course, other types of science. I think a particularly exciting space that I'm going to go on to talk about at the end is the opportunity to do discovery through these projects in large data sets like those produced by our observatory and our survey. Um, I think there's the opportunity to be surprised and I come to believe that citizen science will be crucial in, in all of that. But already I've slipped into talking about outcomes for the science. While that's important on the right here, we have an image of I think one of my favorite things uh, that we've ever done with this sort of citizen science, this is a crowd of people um, from, um, I think this is 2019, um, in Oxford's Christmas Festival. As you can see, it's a traditionally uh, English uh, evening. It's, it's actually raining when this photo is taken. This bunch of people who didn't know they were about to encounter science are classifying galaxies which are projected onto the wall of a building in central Oxford. And, uh, Grant Miller, who you'll be hearing from shortly, is visible. He was actually conducting the crowd who ran left or right uh, and positioned themselves in order to classify particular galaxies. So this takes citizen science beyond the web. But the, the crucial thing is this is a bunch of people who didn't expect to participate in science, but who did something that actually contributed to our papers. And that loop is, is really important. Now, I don't want to spend too much time um, convincing you that this is a useful thing to do with large data sets. If you've encountered large data sets, you know that um, data cleaning, sorting, classification, and exploration are crucial to getting the most out of almost any one science. And citizen science has, in the more than a decade I've been talking about the stuff at the PCW meetings, um, become, I think, part of astronomers' lexicons. But if you, if you need convincing, uh, let's look at some, some fun results. So we have a project called Gravity Spy, um, run with a, a large collaboration of people, uh, not directly involved, but this is where people are classifying noise from the LIGO detectors. So volunteers sort through uh, these frequency time diagrams. I guess if you're a radio astronomer, these are waterfall plots um, and categorize noises. Um, and different categories of noises can then be investigated. Um, famously, one of the types picked up by uh, the volunteers turned out to correspond to ravens pecking at ice that builds up on the vent lines that transport nitrogen out of the side of the detector. Um, but before you could go and find the ravens and have a word with them about their pecking of ice, you need to know that it's creating a characteristic signal in the detector. And even now, even though LIGO is a reasonably mature project, uh, volunteers are still finding new types of cluster. This is the pizzicato uh, noise pattern, which was just identified by uh, volunteers and maybe has something to do with violin modes deep in the, in the detector. We could do astrophysical data as well. I'd highlight, I think, if you want a recent example, the work of my PhD student, Nora Eisner, um, who's been leading the Planet Hunters TESS project, looking at light curves um, from NASA's TESS planet hunting satellite, looking for periodic signals 
uh, transits in light curve data is the kind of thing that I think most people would expect to be an easily tractable machine learning or algorithmic problem. It can, of course, be approached that way, but we're still finding that there's a niche for volunteer review of these light curves. And volunteers go through newly released test data in a day or two each month as the data comes out. And Nora's results point you to her paper, which is just out in Munras, show that these are all the, the tests objects of interest in blue. And then in orange or, or pink here are the discoveries likely candidate planets from planet hunters. And you can see that inspection by volunteers is enabling us to reach to deeper, um, to, to longer orbital periods. Uh, makes sense. There are fewer transits visible for those uh, candidates. Um, but it shows how citizen science can extend the reach of a survey. Um, I imagine that a typical example for Vera Rubin might be to look at lower signal to noise transients, something that we've just done, we've been doing in the optical with ZTF, and which we've been doing really rather successfully with Chime uh, in the radio. Now, I've mentioned Zooniverse a few times, and it was in the introduction. So Zooniverse is a online platform which began in 2007 with Galaxy Zoo and has existed as a platform for more than uh, a decade now. It's hosted more than 200 projects, not all of them astronomical. You can see penguins and shells and all sorts of, of things here. And the idea is to create both a shared platform of practice so that if you want to build a citizen science project or if Rubin Observatory wants to build a citizen science platform, they don't have to start from scratch, but also to create a shared community of volunteers so that the burden of advertising your particular project which may only exist for a week or two if it's got relatively small numbers of images, uh, doesn't fall on the, the uh, fall on the, the particular scientists that can be handled by the Zooniverse. And I'm sure that a large proportion of the two million or so registered Zooniverse volunteers will want to be Vera Rubin citizen scientists, Vera Rubin participants, and will go actively looking for projects associated with the exciting project that we're all part of. Really, the, mo the most exciting th thing for me is that the support from Rubin, partly by the project, as you've heard, but also from the LSST UK in kind contributions, means that for the first time we have dedicated support for a scientific community who want to build citizen science projects. Uniquely, you will have resources to help you get the best out of citizen science, something we haven't really been able to offer other people. However, we're not gonna build your projects for you. Um, I think you get an enormous amount out of shaping and building your own project. And that's why we've built the Zooniverse Project Builder. If you go to zooniverse.org slash lab, you can log on and using a, an interface in the browser, you can start to build your own project. And I thought as this is a workshop, I thought it'd be uh, excellent to have a live demo of that. And then I was very quickly aware that I'm not going to give the live demo because I'm terrified. So I brought in a specialist uh, and I'm going to hand over to Grant Miller, who's the Zooniverse project manager, uh, a recovering astronomer and the person who knows the project builder best. So Grant, over to you. Hi, Chris. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the man for the job, it sounds like. Uh, really what I want to get across to you here um, with this live demo that's going to go perfectly well is how quickly and easily you can actually build a, a prototype citizen science project on, on the Zooniverse uh, platform. So really want to encourage people who are planning on having a, an actual project down the line that they can do this, you know, in, in a few minutes or lunchtime, whatever, just to really get a feel for the platform. So let, let's go for it. First of all, I'll try and share my screen. Um, Okay, so you should be seeing the Zooniverse platform in my face. Okay, great. So the first thing's first to build a Zooniverse project, you go to zooniverse.org and create an account and log in if you don't already have one. I know a few people on here have actually built projects already and some people might already have logins, but either way, log in and then you'll see this button that Chris was showing you there, the build a project button. So to get started, all we have to do is press that button and scroll past the hundreds of projects I've built in the past, <laughs> uh, you'll see this big green button front and center if you're coming into it fresh, create a new project. And this is us off to the races already. So we come up with a name, uh, it doesn't matter, you can change it later on, but it is part of the URL, so be aware of that. So we're gonna go for Galaxy Zoo, uh, Vera C Rubin Demo. 
It's worth uh, mentioning, by the way, that your username is also part of your project URL. So do pick a username carefully. We've had, um, um, yeah. yeah, we've had people choose teenage teenage band favorites and so on, and then have to change them when that <laughs> proves less than professional. Yeah. Um, so uh, you can put in a short description. This is just to fill out some of the basic details. So you're, so you're off and running before you even enter the, the, the project builder. So we'll just say, help us sort galaxies. Um, and then you can put more in-depth stuff. We're just going to write blurg here just now, and then yeah. da, 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 that right. science will go here. Um, and then you can create a project. Uh, so that will take you, it'll automatically fill in those things you added there, and that'll take you into the main project builder interface. Uh, on this main landing page, you can do things that affect kind of how the how the landing page of, of your citizen science project looks. We'll just do a couple of really quick ones here. Um, we will bring up something I prepared earlier, which is this folder. <laughs> and we'll drag and drop a Galaxy Zoo logo into here. Um, brilliant. And we'll uh, drag and drop a nice, um, a nice big background image. So we're off and running. If we actually press the view project button, you can kind of get a live view of what your citizen science project looks like. We so should we should say, by the way, that we're likely to have some Vera Rubin templates for these so that if you're doing something for the transients collaboration or, or a solar system project, you may you should be able to select uh, standard styles and so on. Although I'm pleased to say we we went for teal as a color before the observatory did. So it's nice to see that that branding fits. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so uh, the kind of live view of the, 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 the view of what your volunteers will see is up here. Um, you've got it now. It's there's the Galaxy Zoo logo, here's the name, here's the little bit, the intro, the tagline that we put in. But this is really just a, a landing page for our website, it's nothing else at the moment. You can't click on this classify button because we haven't actually built anything yet. So let's go build it. Um, so if we go into the project builder, there are a few different tabs here that help you build out the kind of fully fledged citizen science project that you're going to make. But just to do a prototype, you're really only interested in two of them. You're interested in the workflows and the subject sets. Uh, in Zooniverse parlance, the workflows are the set of tasks you want people to do on your data. And the subject sets is your data. So first of all, we're going to upload some data so we've got something to play around with. So we'll go to the subject set, just create a new one, give it a name, uh, test one, and then we can drag and drop some Galaxy images. Now, there are uh, command line tools and Python tools for doing this, for uploading a large amount of data, uh, very much so. And I know, understand for, for Vera Rubin, there will even be different pipelines for, for uploading data to projects. But for building your prototype, you just want to throw a handful in there. You can just use the graphical user interface here. And um, we're just going to, well, there's one. Um, let's do another one, actually. Uh, we're going to throw two two images in here. You you will probably have more in your project. So it says we've got two subjects ready to upload, and we're going to upload them. And there's the progress. Great, we've got data. So now we have a website, and we've got data. Now we just need to ask, you know, what do we want people to do on that data? So as I said before, the two things you're most interested in are the workflows and the subject sets. The workflows is where you're going to set those list of tasks. So we're going to create a new workflow, and we're going to say. Uh, we're going to call it test one as well because we're not very imaginative. And um, in here is where you're going to set up the tasks. As standard, there are four tasks on the, on, on the Zooniverse Project Builder. The two most common ones are the ones I'm going to show you off today, and you can explore the others yourselves. Uh, but the two most common ones are a question task. Um, and the other most common one is a, is a drawing task where you're actually annotating on the data itself or on the image. So we're just going to really add a, a quick question task here. It's going to be, um, is the galaxy smooth or does it have features? Which is the first question in, in Galaxy Zoo. And it's the first way of sorting between elliptical and spiral galaxies. So we're going to ask that. And down here, we can add any answers we want. So we're going to say smooth as an answer. And we're going to add another one that is features. And then we're going to add a third one that's like, this ain't a galaxy, just in case we get something weird in there. Um, OK, so now we've got three answers to that first question. Um, we're also going to make sure that we 
are asking these questions on the right data. Uh, so we're just going to go to the associated subject set section here and choose the data we want to ask these questions on. If you were running a fully fledged project, you could imagine you would have lots of different data sets uploaded perhaps, and you want to choose the right one. We're just going to choose the only one that's uploaded there. Um, so hopefully that is being selected. It says loading. There we go. And I'm just going to show you quickly, just before we finish this, the, the drawing task and how simple that is to do and kind of make, making multiple step workflows. So we're going to add a drawing task here as well. And we're going to say, please draw around the spir spiral, spiral galaxy. And we're going to... Add... It's nice you're putting deliberate mistakes in, Grant. So that exactly. it's real. It's great. We're going to call this drawing tool spiral box. We're going to make it a rectangle and it's going to be nice and green. Uh, you can choose any color you want, but we're going to have green here. And one thing we just have to do before we have a look at this is go back and say, we only want people to draw boxes if it is a spiral galaxy. So we'll make this conditional. So if people say there's features, we can choose that the next thing to happen is to show them that next question, that drawing task that we've set. But if, if they say it's smooth or they say this ain't a galaxy, it'll just submit that classification and show the, the volunteer the next image. So I took a lot of time there because I was waffling on, but in theory, we should have a working Zooniverse <laughs> prototype project now, if this has worked out. So let's go back to our, um, our project here. We're going to refresh. We should now see it looks a little bit different. Oh, our background images showed up, so it's looking nice. It says we've got two subjects uploaded and we now have a get started button. And if we click that get started button, we're gonna see a picture of a galaxy and we're gonna see our first question. Is the galaxy smooth or does it have features? In this case, we're gonna say it's got features because it looks like a nice spiral galaxy. And then if we say next, we should see the spiral box task that asks us to pre please draw around the spiral galaxy. We can draw a box on there like that. We can click done. It'll give us a little summary of what we've done there. And then if we click next, it will give us another piece of data to look at. And just, just very quickly, finally, to tell you where to go after that. Um, your data is all, all those classifications, as we call them, all that data that you've just submitted there is saved and available in the data export tab here. You can just click this button and it'll give you a CSV file that gives you the answers that any volunteer submitted on, on those questions that you set up. And that is how easy it is to build a prototype on the Zooniverse platform. Thanks, Grant. Um, that's just scratching the surface of what the platform could do. But I wanted to show you the simple version because I think the, the first step to thinking about this stuff is to try and build a project. Um, the key is to make sure that those questions are simple uh, and that the call to action is straightforward. Um, and I think, um, you know, you, the best way to do that, especially if we're used to thinking about our own science, is to build a little interface, share it with other people, play with it ourselves, and you get a good sense of what you could get out of your data. So if you're even contemplating the possibility that this might be part of your research flow in the future, and given that you're here, I hope you are, um, then please give it a go and then talk to us about what else is needed. Two things that we didn't show in the demo I want to make sure I mention is very importantly, translations are now enabled so that you can easily set up translations of your site. Obviously that's important for an international uh, project such as our own. Um, and secondly, that um, projects will end up in added to, uh, with the help of the, the EPO team, um, to a LSST or Vera Rubin, we need to update this organization, which will collect all of the projects together. So volunteers will have one place to go to see projects. So I see there's a question in the chat, yeah, what that project that Grant produced is already shareable. So Grant can share that. You can either add people to the project and have collaborators who can see it, or you can make it public so that you can share the URL with whoever you like for beta testing, um, or you can, can make it public. We have a large number of volunteers who like to help with beta testing, but if you've got your own people, it, it, it's easy to share this. Um, in fact, the same tools can be used. In fact, Grant's now sharing the, the link in the, in the Slack. The same tools can be used for your collaboration to, to, to review data as well. So some very quick top tips for those contemplating building a project. Um, pretty pictures aren't everything. We know that people like to look at all sorts of data and how 
we've actually tested this, how beautiful they perceive the images to be doesn't predict their willingness to engage with them for science. Um, but if you have penguins in the project, there's very strong evidence that that helps. So, so you may want to think about that. Um, a clear call to action really matters. With your planet hunters, which I mentioned earlier, tells you that with your help, we're finding planets around other stars. People can understand immediately what the goal of the project is. Um, sorting exoplanet transits is, is much harder to understand. As I've said, you should try and build a project early on. You learn a lot by doing so. Um, and once you get a bit further on, I think you, you need a plan to communicate with the volunteers who are helping you. Now, how teams do this ranges from a spectrum of the Backyard Worlds team, um, Mark Kushner and co, who have weekly science calls, which are open to many of their citizen scientists, to people who blog once a month. I think it depends on the scale of the effort, the type of the project and how much time you have, but you do need a communication plan. Um, and that's especially true on projects, particularly transient projects, where data is going to appear on a regular schedule. Um, you need a way of communicating to volunteers that data will come every month or every week or every night. Um, it's important to make that initial step simple. Remember, we're trying to get people who hadn't decided before they hit the site that they wanted to do science. And so ideally, people would be able to go quickly into that task. Um, without having to learn a lot of background. I, one of the best decisions we made about Galaxy Zoo was that we didn't try and teach people what a galaxy was until after they classified. But once people have taken part, they're highly motivated. Um, and so then providing as much metadata, context, links to other resources as possible is, is important. So you could think of these projects as, as engines of motivation that turn people into uh, people who want to know more about your particular part of the science. Um, and finally, plan for success. It's worth always worth thinking about what you'll get if you get thousands of volunteers, not just hundreds of thousands. Um, but with all that done, I, I hope that you'll be able to build your projects. Um, and I'm hoping at least some of you are already at zooniverse.org slash lab um, putting projects together. Um, that, of course, exists for, for the foreseeable future, and we're, we're around to help. In the last 10 minutes, though, I want to talk a bit uh, about some, some more creative or, or interesting or, or different approaches to citizen science that I think will be important in the, the Rubin era. Um, obviously, one place where we're going to be overwhelmed with the variety and velocity of data that's coming at us is via uh, the transient pipeline. And we, of course, have the community brokers, which are going to help filter up that for us. But I think there's opportunity there to um, really sort through and, and try and find some of the unusual things in the brokers. So we've been piloting a project with uh, Meg Schwarm and the Lazare people at QUB and, and Edinburgh, along with collaborators at Minnesota. And um, this slide will be in the slide deck that's uploaded. Don't worry about it now, but to say that we've managed to connect Zooniverse to Lazare as a broker so that you could set up filters on the broker and then be able to pipe the output of that to the Zooniverse and indeed the results from the Zooniverse back to the broker. Um, we've done this with the Zare. We're also talking to Fink and we, we're happy to talk to any of the other brokers who, who want to uh, incorporate citizen science or feeding citizen science projects into their plans. As an example of the kind of thing that um, one might do with that, I, I think I'm realizing I've crowdsourced the talk. We had, we had brilliant introductions from Melissa and, and Lauren Grant did the demo. I've stolen these slides from Matt Nickel at the University of Birmingham, um, who is thinking about how to find tidal disruption events um, from supermassive black holes um, in order to feed a Liverpool telescope and, and other follow-up programs. So, this is an example. You can see the light curve on the left um, from um, mainly from ZTF, I think, um, and then the follow up on, on the right. So the idea is to identify these characteristic light curves. Um, he's already set up a filter using Lazare from the ZTF stream. Um, and that does OK um, by getting rid of the known AGN, which is handled by a code called Sherlock. They get about a thousand objects per month, and 0.1% of those are likely to be a real tidal disruption event. So you'd want to do better than that. And you can do better than that. So they've fiddled about with the stream. They've put up these extra filters that look at things like uh, the offset of the peak, the days since the first detection of the peak, the color, 
how far things are from going to claim. And this reduces that thousand a month down to 50, which is easily eyeballable by, by students, even, even busy and stressed students. Um, but they were finding that they were missing uh, many of the TDEs. So they thought about how this should look as a citizen science project. Um, and so what they have to do is characterize their data. So here is an example. So the characteristics of an actual TDE are that they're smooth and stable. Uh, so they, they rise and then fade, but we want to find them while they're rising. They're typically blue, and they're usually in bright galaxies when they're at low redshift, but they're in centrally concentrated hosts. So these are good examples. This is a bad example. This is an AGN. It's still central. It's still a bright galaxy, but the curve shows much more variability. So you can use cuts on detection date, but it's much easier to just look at the light curve and see that it, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. We've got cataclysmic variables to worry about. These are faint stars, which have ended up in the galaxy cap for some reason. Again, you could filter on the host brightness, but you throw away the TDEs in faint galaxies, which might be interesting. Um, this is easy, again, easy to see by eye because you can inspect the light curve and see the thing. Um, we've got supernovae in faint hosts. So if you've got a faint host, the supernova tends to look like it's close to the center, even if it isn't. Um, again, you look by eye, you can see that that's not a good match to the nucleus of a galaxy, so you discard it. Uh, and then there are nuclear supernova. This is really tough. Uh, and these may be something that experts need to look at. So this is a scientific problem that they've come up with. They've characterized clearly their, their five uh, possible classifications. And as you can see from the demo that we did with Grant, it wouldn't take very long to produce that project. So Matt presented this at the Royal Astronomical Society National, National Astronomy meeting a few weeks ago. Uh, and we we will shortly build the project uh, and be able to test this um, rather than, than worrying too much about it. Now, lots of you will be wondering about machine learning, which is obviously something that, that's progressed particularly from image classification. And, and one part of the story is that Zooniverse projects are ideal for training your modern deep learning networks, which depend on size and fidelity and training set to control their accuracy. So I anticipate we'll have a lot of initial projects in the first year or two of the survey um, that will produce that training sets, which will be passed to, um, to computers who will then take on the task of looking for, for many of these algorithms. Um, we performed a similar function for ZTF who used Zuna, a Zooniverse project, some of their initial real bogus classifications um, before uh, handing over essentially to an algorithm. And that works fine, but there are smarter things to do. And I think this is what gives me hope that we won't just be running these projects for the first couple of years of the survey. I think citizen science is some, of this type is something that will run for the entire duration. And Mike Wormsley, um, formerly my PhD student in Oxford, now a Turing Fellow in, in Manchester, adapted the original Galaxy Zoo site so that when you click enhanced, what you see are images that are pre-classified by a Bayesian neural network that can predict which images it wants people to see, or rather which images the network will most benefit from being reviewed by people. And by using this sort of active learning loop, Mike's network is the equivalent of about 10 volunteers. Um, Galaxy Zoo often runs with 30 or 40, so it's not doing the whole job, but it's doing most of it. More excitingly and more experimentally, when you train these sort of modern machine learning routines, you can use the, the representation that they derive through deep learning magic of the data set to map galaxies relative to each other. So this is a, a broad representation of the space of galaxies, in this case from, from Sloan. And then we can explore this space. So in, in Mike's case, um, he's built a site that if you give it a galaxy, like a ring galaxy or something like that, you can then see all the other galaxies in the network that um, appear similar. Um, what citizen science got to do with this? Well, I think two things. One is that I'm pretty sure that the reason this works very well or seems to work very well is that it was tr this network was trained on the Galaxy Zoo decision tree. So it had built into it, into its training set, some semantic understanding of how astronomers think about the types of galaxies that they see. Just as in the, the TDE example, that categorization had some semantic understanding of how astronomers think about categorizing those types of events. That means that it's much more likely as a network to have a notion of similarity 
that corresponds more to how we think about galaxies. And so that makes it a very powerful way of preparing machine learning techniques for similarity like this. Secondly, you can imagine citizen scientists using this. If I find an unusual thing, uh, if I make a discovery via the site, or I find a, a galaxy that I'm interested in, maybe we can build systems that then allow you to say, okay, show me everything that uh, looks similar. Um, in fact, we can go sort of more broadly. If we split the space of everything in, in uh, the Rubin survey into on the y-axis, how unusual it is, and on the x-axis, how interesting it is, we can sort of populate the system. So normal things live in the bottom left. Things that are unusual but boring are probably artifacts or as we're hearing in the other session right now, satellite trails or, or something like that. Um, things that are interesting but not unusual are, are, are kind of fun to think about. I think those are beautiful images. Like those are your nearby spiral galaxies or uh, I guess your, your perfect example of a supernova 1A or something. Um, I'm gonna, every time I give this bit of a, a talk, I offend somebody with their science, but, um, but there must be things that are unusual but not, uh, uh, that are interesting but not unusual. And then of course we want to be in the top right and find the jackpot, the, the unusual and interesting things. And with tools like the C Bayesian CNNs we've been playing with, computers algorithms do a good job of working out how unusual something is. But working out how interesting something is, is a human task and is sometimes in the eye of the beholder. So we're going to incorporate into the system um, something rather like Michelle Lochner's Astronomaly uh, software. We, I talked to her this morning and she's collaborating. So this presents you with an object drawn from a data set. And instead of asking you, is this a spiral or an elliptical? Um, it says, how interesting is this object? And you sort your way through a few of these and the system learns what you think is interesting and starts trying to give you images that it thinks you will find interesting based on your behavior and sometimes based on the behavior of people like you. So this is essentially Amazon's recommender system, but for uh, data exploration. And you can see this is a very powerful way for an individual to explore a data set, but we're really looking forward to putting the crowd to work in this way. Um, and I, I, we've started doing experiments with that, working with Kate Story Fisher, uh, from New York University, who has the wonderfully weirdgalaxy.es site, which is a similar mapping of galaxies from HSC. Um, and we've tested a project where we've shown this, these galaxies to, shown the most unusual galaxies to volunteers and just asked them which of these are interesting. And what's, in, what's, fast, what's interesting, I guess, from the response from that talk, from this test, is that half the people found this an easy task and enjoyed it. And the other half found it quite difficult because we didn't tell them what was interesting. In fact, if you go to the field guide here, we just told them what wasn't interesting. And I think we need to learn a lot about how to set up this sort of project where we're looking for discovery. And I think that's particularly important when we think about the other half of all of this. I've done my usual thing of starting off by saying that we're talking about citizen science for science and engagement. And then I've talked about science, partly because of who the audience is. But we want to reach as wide an audience as possible. We want to reach the, if not the people wandering around Oxford in the, in, in the middle of a winter lights festival, we want to reach people who encounter um, the Zooniverse in classrooms, for example. We've run uh, the prototype of the schools program here in the UK and, and got great feedback from teachers. These are quotes from teachers uh, whose students have encountered the Zooniverse project. We want to perhaps even reach people in museums. This is somebody celebrating galaxy classification on the floor of the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. Um, but we do want to reach this, this broad audience. Um, I always end up talking about a concept from the museum world of threshold fear, which is the idea that <clears throat> this is the National Gallery in London. It's an imposing building. And you're only gonna walk up the steps and go into the building if you already think of yourself as somebody who can get something out of looking at a painting. And nothing that the museum does inside, it can put on whatever exhibitions it likes, it could give the best labels, it could provide the best curators and the best uh, experience to its visitors. But none of those things are gonna change the fact that many people won't walk up the steps and go in because they don't think it's for them. 
one of the great joys of citizen science as we practiced it in the Zooniverse has been, and we have lots of data to show this, that people don't feel this threshold fear because they stumble into science, because they find themselves on a web page and classify a galaxy before they're thinking about it. They're able to stumble into science and, and believe that they have something to contribute before we say, are you a citizen scientist? And I think one of the challenges we've got that I'm looking forward to exploring with everyone is to do these targeted searches that use clever machine learning that um, allow us to search deliberately for serendipity and to find the unusual uh, and exciting things that are gonna be hidden in the data that we're looking at while maintaining this ability to make this a mode of uh, interaction that, that really everyone can, can help with. To do that, we need to get going sooner rather than later. We need example projects of the kind of things that we might do with Zooniverse and, and Rubin. So if you do have a data set lying around or an idea, then please let us know. Um, we can adapt and build and, and explore what we might do, but only in the context of the science that you want to do in collaboration with our 2 million volunteers. So. Um, I think I'm just about on time and I think I've managed to leave 15 minutes for questions. So I'll stop there. If you can see the Slack, there are a couple of questions that have been posted there. I can okay. Them. Yeah, I'm just scrolling back now. So, okay. uh, Yay, somebody built a project, that's good. Um, so, uh, Aprajita, hello. How many languages are now available on Zooniverse? If Grant is still on, he will be able to give us a better number um, because the use the, we, we've crowdsourced the translation as well. So project owners can open up um, translation of their projects to a crowd. Uh, and so I know we have a, at least 15 different languages, but most projects typically exist in one or two um languages grant do you have more detail i don't actually have have the total number for you um and i know we have uh i think at last i looked there was something like 20 to 30 um kind of languages that people had translated projects into but as as chris says most projects only exist in one or two some have uh, you know 10 or so um but it, it, it's growing all the time uh, i think one of the key considerations to think about though is in translating the, the science and the actual tasks. So just making sure you have someone uh, who's willing to translate with you and is also has a good understanding of, of, the, of the science and the task that you're asking people to do, because that could, could cause some, some discrepancies in the data you get at the end if you're looking at data from, from different languages. One of the things I hope we can do is create a project team of people who do the final review in different languages so that we can sort of do some, some data verification. So we'll be looking for people to do that at some point. Um, Dan uh, in Slack asks, um, is there a risk that users might be overwhelmed by choices if the number of projects grows rapidly? Are projects curated or organized somehow? This, this is a very important question, of course. Um, and it's something we've worried about for a long while. So. Um, the first thing to say, which we didn't emphasize, is that before a project is advertised to the Zooniverse audience, and by extension, when we get there, advertised to the observatory's own audience, there is a review step. So there's a double lock in the projects. When you finished your project, you can share it with people yourself, but when you're ready, you pass it for a formal beta test. And it gets reviewed by the Zooniverse team. And it also gets reviewed by the Zooniverse volunteers who, um, are able to make a decision about whether they want it on their platform or not, um, which is really important. We get good feedback from the volunteers and, and sometimes they, they, they very rarely say, look, we don't want this at all, but we often get, look, this is too complicated, this is too hard, this needs better explanation, we don't convince by the science case. So there's that level of approval and then there'll be details to be worked out, but some approval before a project gets promoted by uh, the EPO team and if Lauren you want to comment on that then do um, but so that there's that but we still might get a lot of projects of course however most volunteers as I said people don't sit down gen very few people sit down and make time in their week for citizen science and um, there are those people uh, but that happens late in people's engagement so most volunteers come take part in a project for a day or two or a little while 
and, and then they're, they're okay. And so new projects we find rejuvenate those old um, previous collaborators. So, so I'm hoping we can have a nice ecosystem in which um, volunteers move from, from project to project. Um, I suspect we're not going to, to run out of, of people uh, for the science cases that we want to, to do. Um, Lauren, I'm going to pause in case you want to comment on that. Yeah, I think our approach has always just been like, we would love to have that problem. And so if we get there where there are too many projects and we need to think about if we want to stagger them or something, then that's definitely something that we want to work to support as many projects as possible. And we'll see what happens when we get there. Yeah, uh, we also see volunteers choosing to support projects where the scientists are communicative so that they typically don't mind how the scientists are communicative, but projects where uh, people set the project up and then disappear don't do well because people move to projects where they feel their classification is going to be useful. Um, Charles in, in chat, I see asked, um, is there a practical limit how many Zooniverse projects Ruben will support at any one time? Um, that we're still working on quite how to handle the data. So that might impose a limit ultimately in terms of millions of images or something. Um, but in terms of connections and, and users, I, I don't think we have any strong limit there. Um, so, so I think certainly there, there may be calls on time for the people working with Melissa and Lauren and Co. But in terms of the technical aspect, we can we we can support whatever. Charles, did you want to say something? Just wanted to say thanks. That that's amazing, and I think it'll Ple be wonderful. Yeah, P pleasure. Um, I should boast, I suppose, that our team, my team, are, are great, and we've done tie-ins with TV and, and things, so we can we know we can have tens of thousands of concurrent users uh, without blinking. Um, so we've had Brian Cox stare down a television camera and tell his fans to go to the site and it, it survived. So, so that's good. Um, question from, uh, sorry, Yogesh, I guess, sorry for the pronunciation. Um, currently in Zooniverse projects, is there a limit on how much data can be uploaded? At the minute, you'll find that there's a limit of 20,000 subjects, 20,000 images, but you just need to email us to ask us to extend that. That's no problem. In the Ruben era, um, I think thing we will we're still working out where the data sits and how to handle that. But it will likely be a soft limit for everyone just to stop uh, people choosing to start their project by uploading all million images. We want you to test it before you get to that stage. But in practice, I think we'll be able to support very large numbers of images, um, which is good. Um, Meg asks, have there been decisions about what metadata can be associated with a Zooniverse Rubin subject? In other words, what could be viewed by the citizen scientists? Um, I think that's going to be reviewed on a case by case project, uh, basis by the project. And Melissa is unmuted, which means there's probably an official answer. Yeah, there is. It's in the um, data policy document. Um, there's a specific byline for metadata um, and what can be shared. I'm just going to pop that right into the chat for you. Thanks. Um, we're sort of sympathetic to obviously we we don't want to um, need we don't want to to thoughtlessly break people's data rights. People have worked hard for those, and I know the project depends on them. Um, on the other hand, the more metadata I didn't really talk today about the wonderful work done by advanced citizen scientists who have come up through the project. And in many cases, they're writing their own, certainly research notes and, and occasionally papers and, and doing work which is enabled by access to metadata. So um, we know that projects will benefit from sharing metadata, uh, but obviously um, there, there are project considerations there as well. And we have successfully run projects like some of the transient searches that we've done where we haven't supplied any metadata uh, to volunteers. So where we've uploaded thumbnails of potential supernovae, but no coordinates, for example, which is important. Um, yeah, thanks for posting that, Melissa. Yeah, there's a statement that essentially says um, metadata reviewed and approved by uh, the observatory will be distributed. Um, and we're working out what that will look like, I think. Um, Hopefully, again, we have a problem of success and we're swamped with the request. Um, Aprodita, do we have any indication from now how the number of Zooniverse citizens grows with new survey data? Have we noted growth in the community when you've launched high profile data such as Rubin? Um, certainly, where, so the closest example I've got probably is NASA. 
So um, over the last few years, NASA has collectively, under the leadership of Mark Kushner, started trying to promote citizen science and NASA citizen science. And a large number of those projects are on the Zooniverse. And we're seeing a bit of a cohort effect. So there are definitely people who want to participate in all the NASA programs. And so my hope is that because of the wonderful work of the, of the EPO team, there will be a bunch of people who are not just committed to citizen science and their projects, but they're committed to uh, Rubin citizen science. And I'm pretty sure that will happen. There'll be a lot of excitement about the data. Um, I, think, I, I think trying to predict trends will be really hard. We had our busiest year ever last year, but I think that's to do with other circumstances, um, which we don't want to repeat. Um, and so um, I, I think it's hard, but I, I think the, the trick is to plan to scale projects. So I think if we can, if you can have your data ready so that if somebody writes an article on, on BBC or NBC or wherever, and, and there's a flood of people to your project, you've got stuff for them to do, um, but also think hard about exactly what you do need people to do so that you're not wasting time so that that effort is, is shared equitably. Um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll see where we go. We do have a lot of tools that we don't use very often. So we know that, um, you know, regular newsletters from project teams work very well at incentivizing people, but we're not very good at writing those. With more support, I think we could do better at that. We also know that challenges work. So, so gamification in these projects is a contested area that I happily talk about for an hour or two another time. But um, we know that collective challenges work really well. So together, let's get through this data set is a really powerful message. And so we could help projects make more use of those sorts of tools to make sure that uh, we deliver the science and the engagement that we want from each project. I think I may have come to the end of the questions. Amanda notes in Slack in, in one of the threads that um, stay tuned for the step-by-step how-to guide for starting a citizen science project specifically with Ruben data as that's being written now. So that's certainly true, but don't wait for that to start playing around with the, the platform if you are so inclined. Yeah, I definitely want to encourage people to play around as much as you want, but just to know that currently what we're doing um, with Melissa's team, Chris's team, EPO team is trying to think through what's the most efficient workflow <laughs> for scientists to start a project. So I don't expect that you're gonna to have to independently reach out to EPO and then reach out over here and then do this and then do that. We're trying to work through the process of how to get this as smooth as we can. And I don't know exactly what the answer is now, but you know, we got another year of our construction project for EPO and then hopefully we'll have some documentation to release for you. Good. Um, I'm going to use the last 30 seconds to gratuitously advertise the fact that there's a postdoc position in anomaly detection that covers lots of these areas available in Oxford and the deadline is next week. So if you're interested in that, you should talk to me. We're also hiring for a software developer in the EPO team, somewhat related to citizen science, but uh, we'll definitely be put to good use. Is that the web developer position that you mentioned a couple of days ago? Wonderful. Anyone else have any jobs to advertise before we, before we go? Okay. In that case, um, please, everyone, join me. Use your reactions. Let's thank Chris and Grant for an excellent session. That was really great and informative. Um, and keep on discussing in the Slack um, if, if you still have questions. <laughs>